Michigander Dante Nore is a top 100 prospect, according to the pipeline folks. He is a left-handed hitter, uh, has made a commitment to Mississippi State. He's got a bright future ahead of him in our game, but he probably could have chosen uh, other athletic pursuits. His dad had that same choice back in the day, and we're not talking to Dante. We're talking to his dad, Micah, who joins us on Hot Stove on this Monday. Uh, he is with the Minnesota Timberwolves in Los Angeles, the top-ranked Minnesota Timberwolves, best record in the Western Conference, by the way, with a showdown against the Clippers, who are nipping at their heels. Uh, man, we really appreciate the visit here, Micah. Good morning to you. Good morning to you all. Thank you for having me. I, we want to hear about uh, the connection that you have to baseball. Uh, I guess that your son has to baseball, but I guess it starts with your dad, right? Baseball is in uh, in your DNA, in the Nori family business. Yes, uh, my father, he was fortunate enough to, um, he played baseball at Indiana University, and then he made it to the AAA farm system with um, with the New York Mets. And then he uh, retired to coach back in the day, you know, 1970s, everybody coached everything. So baseball, football, and basketball. He coached my brother and I in, in baseball, and then he moved on and uh, actually helped some college teams. He was at Indiana University with Tracy Smith. He was at Miami of Ohio with Tracy Smith, and he was also at Arizona State with Tracy Smith. And uh, so Dante didn't have much of a choice when he was in. My brother played at Miami of Ohio as well. So no, Dante did not have much of a choice that he was going to have to play some baseball. Micah, how about your background in baseball, and how much did you love it uh, growing up? I, I, obviously, it's a, it's a great game. I, I love basketball. I've been in it for the last 26 years in the NBA. But baseball is a game that, to me, um, it's it's just one of those things that's an individual sport within a team sport. So, you know, it's you versus the pitcher. It's pitcher versus hitter. And they're just uh, unlike basketball, where basketball is moving 100 miles an hour, I think baseball is a little bit more of a thinking game where you can make more adjustments to according to positioning and the pitches that you're throwing. So. But at the end of the day, uh, my baseball career got cut short. I just wasn't good enough to move on. And I realized that I loved coaching and got an opportunity to coach uh, with Butch Carter as an intern in Toronto 25 years ago. Thought I'd go up there for a year. And here I am 25 years later with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Not good enough. I think just uh, one of the scouts missed you. 305, 20 home runs, 127 RBIs. That's getting it. Yeah. Yeah, but unlike most people, that took me four years. All these other guys now are playing <laughs> two and three in college. But uh, no, I was. Um, I appreciate that. But uh, I think that uh, my dad always gives me a hard time because I couldn't run at all. So when Dante can run, and my dad tells my brother and I that it skipped a generation because he could run. So you know, obviously, it's it's our fault. You know, I'm curious from a coaching standpoint, and because you have so much familiarity with our game in baseball, the NBA schedule is such that you can have back to backs. Uh, you could have three, four days off between games on a road trip. What does that do for the schedule of the coaching staff? How do you guys prepare for, say, the Clippers tonight in terms of your timeline? That's a great question. This one, we were fortunate. We had about two days. Our last game was in Milwaukee. We came home, gave them a day off, and then we were practicing Saturday. Yesterday, we met at the plane and flew out. So you have a little bit more time to prepare and actually put together a practice plan that to the things that we will see tonight against the Clippers. So that's how it changes a little bit. And then in a minute here, we're getting ready to go over to shoot around, which will give us another opportunity to walk through everything we will see tonight and hopefully be able to combat what they throw at us. As opposed to on a back to back, we fly to the next city, we sleep, we get up. We usually let the guys sleep in, get up and meet around noon and just have a quick film session and walk through in a hotel uh, you know, ballroom before that game that night. So when you have these days in between, it helps you prepare the other thing it helps is in the West, you're playing teams three to four times. And this is the second time we played the Clippers. And fortunately, we played them about a month ago. So that's not too long in NBA terms. So we're familiar with the team and they have they don't have any injuries. So we play in the same team. So it's good. I got a question for you specific to that then. So, it, you know, if you're approaching a three game series and you're trying to you're coaching against the Angels, let's not let Mike Trout beat us with men on base. Uh, you're coaching against the Clippers tonight. Let's try to not let Paul George and Kawhi Leonard get hot. I mean, uh, duh, like that, that's what everybody <laughs> would try to do. Easier said than done, but does that become part of the calculus? Take the best players away from the opponent? 100%. Absolutely. I think every single night you sit there and you look at 
how it, it sounds crazy, but it's like, how do you want to lose? In other words, if you're going to lose the game, how do you want to get beat? And the worst thing could happen for us tonight is we go over and Kawhi get 35 and Paul George get 35 and Harden get 25 points and 15 assists. So, yes, we want to put them in a position where we make others beat us. I remember a long time ago, got some good advice in the NBA that everybody's shot's not the same. So you can be like, oh, that's a tough shot. Well, it's not a tough shot for Kawhi, not a tough shot for Paul George. Let's force others into those positions to have to make shots to beat us. And you're absolutely right. I think analytics play a big part in the early process as far as game planning to see which direction guys like to go, where do they like the ball. And so you can kind of start your game plan there saying, here's where they're looking to attack us. If they want to go left all night, let's force them to the right and make them uncomfortable and try to make them do something else other than what they're comfortable doing to win basketball games. Micah, this is a really tough question for a pops, for a dad. But can you uh, tell us a little bit about Dante's game? And does he resemble anyone that we cover in the major leagues today? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. He's about 5'10", 5'11", 190 pound center fielder, uh, left, left kid. I think the guys, and again, uh, uh, he can run. He ran a 6'1", 5'60", which was the fastest in the country, a perfect game. And he has the opportunity to stay in center field which I think is what scouts are telling him is big. I think that his game resembles a little bit of the Corbin Carroll, the stuff, the way that you can, he can, he can run the bases and impact the game in different ways. And he's more of a line drive gap to gap type hitter that has a little bit of pop. So, um, and he has a, he's got an opportunity to, uh, to go down to Mississippi state and continue there. If things don't work out for him in the uh, draft. You know, wrapping up the Super Bowl, uh, we, we've heard stories for years about Patrick Mahomes being around Major League Baseball players in the clubhouse, on the field, when his dad was pitching in the big leagues. Uh, I'm sure Dante's been with you uh, during your coaching career. Are there players, are there situations that were impactful for him when he was a little kid? Yes, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's almost like a cheat code. And what I mean by that is I think the biggest thing he's taken from it is he's never in awe of a situation. So, you know, you go to area codes, and there's 400 scouts there, and you're leading off a game. And the one thing he's able to do, and when he's had these meetings with scout and his coaches, is you take a deep breath, and it's just you and the pitcher. So he's, he's not in awe. He's been in NBA locker rooms. He's been around the Kyle Schwarbers and the Joey Vados, the guys that uh, – have played at the highest level. So for him, he can just focus on the game and those butterflies and nervousness are not present. And a lot of it is because as you see what's going up on the board there, the Steph Curry's who he's known since he was a young one, as well as, you know, meeting Kevin Durant and all of these guys, he just, uh, the moments aren't too big. And a lot of that has to do with, he realizes that whether they're NBA superstars or major league all-stars, they're just normal guys that have worked just as hard to get where they are. And that's where, what he's trying to emulate. It's awesome. We yeah. wish, uh, we wish Dante nothing but success moving forward. We'd love to have him on the show and visit with him about his experiences the same way we have with you. Give us a prediction tonight. Who goes off big Carl Anthony towns night, Mike Conley night. Yeah. Let's hope all of them go off. But yes, I think <laughs> with, uh, I think it's going to be a good night for cat. I think that uh, the Clippers play small quite a bit so we'll have some opportunities to play through cat in the post and uh and anthony edwards will definitely do something tonight whether you're, you're going to say oh wow you know so it's uh it should be a really good one winner tonight takes over the the, the lead in the west so yeah. it should be a good basketball game good luck man big night uh, so we really appreciate you taking some time with us to visit with us and uh once again mike a good luck to uh to you to your son and thanks for the time man uh, thank you so much for having me. you guys do a great job i appreciate it